This evening is the Let's Talk debate. And the vision behind this debate comes from the Penner family's childhood. As a family, their father modeled for them free discussion at the dinner table, where all perspectives were welcome and family members were invited to vigorously discuss relevant and hot topics of the day, to bring their best thinking, to be sharp and deep in their thinking, as well as uh, civility and care and compassion for one another. And as a family, this became normal for them. And so the vision for our time together on this debate is to recreate and model that. That's why we don't have a podium or a pulpit up here, but we've got a table and dinner. I think our uh, uh, participants are eating Chick-fil-A and enjoying some food while they're talking. I'll introduce our participants here in a minute, as well as our judges. So I shared with you a bit about the vision of this discussion tonight coming from the Penner family. I also want to just share with you why we're doing this here in this space and at the college. It's important for us to encourage discussion on campus that happens more often and is more routine and welcomed in non-threatening ways. I think it's important for us to empower students to model discussion that fosters caring, vigorous, and uh, respectful discussion, particularly when we disagree. And lastly, we want to, we want to inspire you as students to embody this beyond the college, to take this with you in other communities that you're a part of, and to encourage you to engage culture, disagreement, and dialogue in compelling and, and alternative ways to what we see around us today. We want to invite you to consider the search for truth together and to value vigor and conviction simultaneously with humility and curiosity. So that's the spirit behind this evening. Captain David Iglesias is unable to be with us tonight, so we have a quick video for those of you who can't see him. It's on a little small TV screen up here, because I'm sure at the dinner table we don't have large screen TVs at our dinner tables all the time, so we're gonna welcome him through a video. I'll pull the microphone up and we'll hear a greeting from Captain Iglesias. gratitude to the Penner family, so welcome in his gratitude to our participants, and then he referenced Isaiah 14 in this idea of coming together and reasoning together, not bludgeoning together. So welcome again to our audience, we're grateful that you're going to be here, we're going to invite you to be able to participate. We have these cards that are around the room, if you don't have one nearby, uh, those of you who have one, circulate them, and there will be an opportunity to go to slido.com. And we are asking you to vote only at the beginning and the end. So if you can't be here for the end, please do not vote. If you're able to be here now and at the end, we're asking you to vote. And the uh, side that influences the change the most will be the winning team. And we have judges whom I'll introduce in a minute that will announce the winning debater. And so, audience, you'll select yes or no to the question before the debate, and then you'll select yes or no to the question after the debate. And the team that created the most change will be the winning team this evening. And again, we have some judges that will announce the winning debater. So let me introduce those judges to you now. Dr. Amy Black from 
political science and economics. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Alexander, assistant professor of political science on the faculty in the same department. 2019 alum Joe Engel, a family member. And now let me introduce you to our participants this evening. We have two sides, an affirmative side for this topic. The topic is, is capitalism consistent with biblical principles? And on the affirmative team, we have Lydia King. Lydia Kang, excuse me. Lydia is a junior international relations major from Northern Virginia. And earlier this semester, we've had a release of videos casually introducing this event. The first one was a debate on my half of the sky or Starbucks. The second one was faculty debating whether they like pineapple on pizza. And the third debate was on their favorite uh, Chick-fil-A sauce. So for Lydia, she would choose my half of the sky. She definitely believes in pineapple on pizza and her favorite Chick-fil-A sauce is Polynesian. Next we have Noah Cassetto. <laughs> majoring in international relations in Spanish, and he's from Southern California. He would choose Starbucks because he worked there in high school. He says no pineapple on pizza, and his favorite sauce is the Chick-fil-A sauce. Third on the affirmative team is Nick Diaz, freshman. Nick is majoring in political science and biblical and theological studies, and he's from Massachusetts. He chooses my half of the sky, no pineapple, says it doesn't belong on pizza, and he also chooses Chick-fil-A sauce. On the negative team, we have Brennan Goldman. Brennan is a senior political science major from Florida. He has no preference because he doesn't drink coffee. He has no preference for pineapple pizza, indifferent, and no preference because he doesn't eat fast food at Chick-fil-A. It's a very neutral. Next we have Silas Galveo. Silas is from uh, Texas and he's a senior business economics major. He chooses my half of the sky. He says yes to pineapple and his favorite sauce is barbecue. Next we have Andrew Matthias, a junior transfer from California. So chooses my half of the sky, which seems to be winning tonight. Says yes to pineapple and barbecue sauce. Our, our um, last, no, that's all six. That's everyone. Excellent. So here's how the discussion is going to go this evening. We are going to give an opportunity for one affirmative voice to present their uh, constructive speech for us so that we can hear where they're coming from. Following that, the negative rebuttal uh, the negative side will offer rebuttal and questions, and we'll rotate affirmative to negative until all six have had an opportunity to share their claims and have discussion with one another. Then we're going to open it up for the audience to ask a couple of questions, and then our participants will offer final comments. So we begin this evening with an affirmative constructive speech on my left. The three on my left are the affirmative for the discussion tonight, and the three on my right are the negative for the discussion tonight. So we will begin with Lydia. I'm going to be standing in the back, coming back and forth, and at a 30-second warning, I'll be flashing a flashlight at them from the rear. And if they're not done within those 30 seconds, I will be marching my way towards the table and standing in front of them. So do not be alarmed if you feel like I'm being abrasive and rude. I'm going to try to be playful and keep us going. So that's our uh, game plan for this evening. Again, welcome, Lydia. When I get to the back, you can start. So 
Nick, Noah, and I are arguing that capitalism is consistent with biblical values. And before we start, we kind of wanted to give like a working definition of what um, capitalism is. So capitalism is an economic system which prioritizes private ownership and has a decentralized market in which there is free, free flow of good and labor. And then we also just wanted to really quick um, also define what biblical values are, and those are just values that come straight from like the Bible and biblical concepts. So the first point I wanted to make on why capitalism is consistent with biblical values is because capitalism provides the greatest potential for human flourishing. So as Christians, we know, right, John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief came, comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So clearly, from the Bible, we know that God desires for us to have an abundant life. And the first reason why um, capitalism kind of promotes human flourishing is because it really upholds the whole idea of hard work or economic mobility. So basically, um, I can, okay, so hard work, so basically with um, capitalism, it's all based on competition. So there's a buyer and there's a seller. So it's always gonna be in the seller's best interest to, pro to provide goods that the buyer would want. And it would be in the buyer's best interest to buy the prices at the lowest possible cost. So because of that, the buyer and the seller have like a very, a relationship built on trust. So it's not like an adversarial relationship. So because of this competition, this leads to a lot of specialization in labor. Um, and because of specialization, this kind of leads people to work hard and to also be able to have economic mobility. So we see like in the United States, for example, um, which is a very capitalistic, upholds a capitalistic economic system. People are able to move um, upwardsly economically because they have like the freedom to choose and also the freedom to like make these decisions within the market. Um, another huge reason why capitalism upholds like kind of has the most potential for the greatest human flourishing is because it upholds creativity and innovation. So basically, if you look at different countries that are uh, have like a capitalist um, economic system versus like socialism or um, things like that, like if you look at Russia, for example, Russia has double the population of the UK, but it has half as many businesses created each year. Um, if you look at like the Nobel, uh, like I'm sure you guys are familiar with like the Nobel Peace Prize um, winners, like if you just look at the list, most of them, a lot, a huge percentage of them are from the United States, which has a capitalistic economic system, which provides like the encouragement towards, you know, um, creativity and innovation. Um, we look at the U.S. patent and trade law because the U.S. has like these trade regulations protecting patents. We see so much specialization of labor. Um, and finally, like just kind of going off of the creativity and innovation, this is upholding biblical principles because, as we know, like God is a creative God. And so, even in Genesis 127, it says God created man in His own image. Um, because man is created in his own image, God is such a creative God and he created us to kind of pursue that creativity and innovation with what he's given us. Um, another Bible verse we just wanted to mention is also like Colossians 3, 23 through 24, which kind of upholds the idea of hard work, which says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Um, and so basically because of these two reasons, because capitalism upholds um, creativity and innovation and it also promotes hard work, um, clearly those are biblical values and they promote the greatest human flourishing. So that was our first point. say is, um, well, I'll talk more about uh, the 
the definitions uh, and our constructive response. But I, just to respond to your points about uh, innovation and competition, so these are values that are potentially uh, aligned with human flourishing. You can make an argument that they promote uh, better business environments, better products, that sort of thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a biblical principle to have more efficiency or to make more money or to have more businesses or even Nobel Peace Prizes, which are also um, like that skew towards uh, the United States isn't necessarily a good metric of uh, success in society. And e even coming down to the value of hard work, I think uh, a lot of these values are more still instilled from our culture. Um, and regardless of whether or not they are virtuous or good values, I don't, I don't know if there's biblical precedent that these are the foundation of our faith or that an economic system that uh, benefits from these principles would require us to support it. Because um, even if there are other, even if it is successful compared to other systems, uh, kind of a deal, um, I think we have to look at more than just economic success and those kinds of metrics when we're approaching us as Christians to also think of it um, from a more uh, uh, more grounded in like our theology and in our community. Uh, so, oh, yeah, I'll end finish there. So, you mentioned foundational principles, and you said that those weren't the foundational principles. So, I'd like to take a look at that. So, the foundation to compare capitalism and biblical principles, I'd like to look at the foundations of capitalism itself. And what I've seen when I look at it is that it is based on the foundation, on a vital principle of freedom, of economic freedom to both have private property and the economic freedom to do what you choose with that private property. Uh, it's based on choice, when, on, you get to decide what you do with your money that God has bestowed upon us. So that is, I see the foundational principle of capitalism. And when looking at the Bible, excuse me, to see how they compare I looked first to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he gave humanity the choice between good and evil. We chose poorly, but he didn't take our choice away when we chose poorly. He let us continue. Why? Because he wants us to love him out of our own free will and choice. And so the, decision, the, the, the idea to have freedom, to have that free will, is one that is critical to the, to the biblical, to the, honestly, the gospel story where we choose Jesus Christ and he chooses us. It's all about the decision and about that love that we have. And when looking at the New Testament, I see two places, there are many places more that I can find, but to highlight two places where we see this in play would be the parable of the uh, workers in the vineyard, where the, the master goes out a couple times a day and grabs workers for his vineyard, and he promises each of them uh, one denarius, although they work different hours. And when, you might, that might seem unfair to us, like the one that works more should deserve more. And so when he's asked about this, the the, the Workers who work more ask the master about this. They go, well, I worked more. The master goes, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? We, take, we can take two things from that. And those, are, those are almost verbatim his words. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And so what we, choose, so what we see there is both the, the master's choice to do what he wants with those money and to be generous. He chose to be generous. He could have not been generous. And we see that trust that lady was talking about between the seller and the buyer. We see that they build that relationship that he trusted that they, they, he were, the, the ones who worked more worked for one Daenerys. And he trusted them that he would give them one Daenerys. And so that relationship happened there. And so the, the, the ideas of freedom is critical to the Bible and it's critical for us to choose uh, about to choose uh, capitalism. That's a great word, Nick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Abster. We're going to invite Andrew now. Should I wait until you back there? Are you going back? I'll, I'll do it from here. Okay. For the last couple of years, I've been studying the theology of adoption, what it means to be a child of God and what it means to be in his kingdom, how we're all family. And as brothers and sisters, we have a sort of equality to us. I've been studying how through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have found life, deserving of nothing, deserving not to be alive again while we were dead in our transgressions, but simply him alone and his love was not of any merit of our own. How we are all equal in the kingdom of God. This equality is ultimately where I depart from capitalism. How capitalism will say there's a dis... Or how capitalism will say there's a separation between people. 
how there's the worker and then there's the capitalist, the owner of the property, how there's the exploitation under capitalism, how there's this will to do profit alone, how capitalism ultimately, the theory of the economic theory of capitalism is pro-profit, how ultimately profit is what it seeks and what it pursues. This pursuit of profit exploits the worker, exploits the world, and it seeks itself. Uh, a common way to look at capitalism would be seeing the surplus of the work that one puts in or whatever is made through capitalism and the work and the cost of that production. So the surplus is what is ultimately made and the cost of that making. This surplus majority goes to whoever owns the property under capitalism. It creates a inequality within a capitalist structure. It makes it to where people are no longer equal. Rather, they are seen as worker and owner. This goes against the biblical principles and it and the results of this is seen within a capitalist structure. You see with capitalism how there's enough houses to house everyone, enough food to feed everyone, but because it does not produce profit, it's not seen as good. It's not seen as something that capitalism wants to do. Ultimately, capitalism will pursue this profit, will pursue whatever makes the most money rather than what is virtuous or what is biblical. It will pursue that which the Bible will condemn. It throws away our brotherhood and our sisterhood, how we are one family and how we should be looking after each other, how we are called to love each other, and how we are called to be virtuous. And it laughs at that. This is why capitalism is not biblical, because it will constantly pursue exploitation. We see this in consumption and how production is often done through a exploitive lens. It's all about making the most money, therefore we have thrown away our world in the pursuit of profit. We have thrown away what it means to be equal with each other in order to pursue profit. I'll give my time. Hey, is this our time for a two minute rebuttal? Mm -hmm. Okay, sweet. So you mentioned that um, capitalism is an economic system that um, kind of is for profit and can, because of that it can lead to exploitation. Um, but we just wanted to bring it back to what this kind of like the debate is about. It's whether or not capitalism is consistent for with biblical values. And I think it's clearly like there is no like Christian economic system because we're all flawed. Like every human has sinful nature. And so because of that, we have the choice. So within the capitalistic system or within the socialist system or within other economic systems, because we um, are sinful, that leads to like greed or exploitation, but we would like to argue, as um, my team members will further argue later, that that is why it's our responsibility, that's why we're talking about biblical values, that's why it's our responsibility as Christians to address those problems individually on the individual level. It's not so much the economic system as a whole that is perpetuating this injustice, but it's as each individual member making up that system, what actions are we doing to limit exploitation? Or, you know, even as Christians, like, what is our calling? How are we individually working within this economic system to fight for the poor and to petition for the orphan and to advocate for the, re you know, for the refugee who is in exploitation? And so that would just kind of be our rebuttal to you that it's not so much like, oh, capitalism, it's like a Christian or anti-Christian economic system, but it's more like the individual's roles within that system to make decisions. And that's where the freedom, and that's where us as Christians that comes in and how we respond. I would say that the capitalist, the economic system of capitalism succeeds the most when you pursue profit. To go against profit is to go against the capitalist system. And whenever you turn against the capitalist system, of course, giving to the poor is what you should be doing. And of course, there's the biblical values of giving to the orphans and looking after the widows and looking after the poor. But that's to go against the capitalist system. You are fundamentally going against profit and what is supported by capitalism in order to pursue that motive. Where social welfare, which is what the U.S. has done and put on regulations on capitalism in order to make it uh, a society that is actually livable to be under, 
is going against capitalism and fighting against the ills of capitalism. Thank you, Andrew. Nick? So you mentioned that, uh, it's, it's just, that capitalism has this inequality that, to it. I would argue that freedom, the freedom to, uh, to, to make that choice will, will always lead to an inequality. The, Jesus himself says you will always have the poor among you. So we're not exactly seeking a capitalist. We're not exactly looking for an economic system that is perfect in any way. We are looking for an economic, an economic system that allows the church to do its work that doesn't inhibit the church from the work we're called to, which as Lydia said, is to take care of the poor. And capitalism allows individuals, God gives individuals, he, Jesus talks about the rich and the poor, he, ta he gives instructions to the rich, because there's always rich, and there are always the poor. And so what capitalism does is it allows us to use that richness, that abundance that God has given us, to, to, to some of us, to go out and to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan, to ensure that those in the margins of society are helped and they're guided. So capitalism gives us the freedom and the liberty to allow the church to act. I don't want to, I understand the, the premise is capitalism consistent with biblical principles, but uh, if we take a look at other uh, economic systems which exist in the world, we don't exactly have that freedom. The church is, uh, the church is prosecuted, the church is uh, put on the margins itself, so it's not able to defend for the margins. I, and you mentioned the inequality, I would like to mention the story uh, the parable that Jesus tells of the workers um, of the talents, the workers who received the talents. The master was going away, and all three servants, who, uh, as far as we know, weren't on, di were on different levels of servitude, they all received different amounts of money. One received five, one received three, and one received one. That's how we're all, we're all born into this world as humans, but we are all given different circumstances in that situation. We are, some of us are given more, the five talents. Some of us are born with less, the one talent. But they were all given the opportunity to go out and invest and to make more and to multiply that. And so the ones who did, the ones who went out and invested and made capital, the one with five and three, the ones who made capital, hence capitalism, those people were praised by the master. The master came back and said, good and faithful servant. You have done well with what I've given you. That's how God looks at us. He gives us some amount of money. He gives us some, our, our situation, our family, our friend. He gives us, we're born into this situation that he gets, okay, now go and do good with this. And that's what he asks of us. But the one who didn't, the one who didn't go out and invest, the one who hid his money in the dirt was reprimanded. He didn't go out and use the system. He didn't go out and do good with what was given to him. And that's what capitalism is. It allows us to do the good. It allows the church to act. It allows us to, uh, and when we see injustices, to go out and to petition. Capitalism is always, uh, capitalism is an economic system, yet it is almost always put together with a political system, which is democracy, which gives people, again, more freedom to go out and say, look, there's injustice here. This person isn't treating this person right. So guess what? We have the freedom to go out, use our resources that were given, the five or three talents or one talent, go out, use those resources to advocate for some change. Capitalism allows the church to act, to be free. And that's what God wants us. God wants us to love him. God wants us to choose him. God wants us to choose to be generous. But there will always be the poor among you. And so that's why we, we need capitalism. So that people can make the money and come up with resources, the innovation to go out and help people, to build better bridges, better roads, to provide better jobs for people, to ensure that people have an education. All these things are a, a result of capitalism because the church then has the resources when people and free people choose technology, uh, choose to innovate technology, the church has more resources now to go out and act, to spread the gospel, to show people the love of Jesus Christ. So, in, 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 in closing this uh, part on freedom, it is so critical that the church has the freedom to act and that you have the freedom to do what you want with your money. Again, the parable we saw, he did, uh, do I not have the right to do with our money? To be generous. So God wants us to choose to be generous and to choose him and to choose to do good, and capitalism allows that. So it is consistent with biblical principles, I would argue. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> I would I would strongly reprimand that argument, but not in the typical sense of just attacking it. I'd like to say, abdicating responsibility, though it provides opportunities, the church, we can step in, we can fill the gap, fill the holes, come in and help people, Abdicating responsibility to help people as an economic system, it delineates values. And so in us having a system that doesn't take care of the poor or, or leaves people on their own to suffer, and not just like a typical suffering where you have to work hard and then you can make it out, a suffering where you can't make it out. And I think
think that clearly delineates like what's at the heart of capitalism. I'd like to touch on uh, on Andrew's point again that it's it's profit motivated. A system that doesn't have God first can't be inherently consistent with biblical principle because that's how we are to approach everything in life. We're to approach God first, and then we're to we're called to love others as ourselves. And I know like if we were in a worse position than what we all are here now, if we didn't have this Chick Fil A here in front of us, the donuts, whatever. Uh, and if we were in like in it, like really in, it, really struggling, we'd want somebody there to to help us, not just tell us to work harder, not just tell us to attack life, and just that it'll come to us if we we work hard, but somebody to be there to love us, to help us up. That's what Jesus did, and I think that's what we're called to do. Yeah. Thank you, Silas. Brennan, you're up. Okay. So now's the fun part. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, briefly, um, a little more in depth about what it, capitalism actually is. Um, so we're not going to. Uh, what just one issue we're going to encounter in this debate is we're operating under a slightly different definition, which isn't just free markets, but specifically the relation of how money is generated in the markets, um, and that's easy to see because, for example, uh, as uh, some of these arguments were pointing out earlier. There's money, there's saving, there's uh, a lot of principles that we see in our modern economy of resources that represent money and exchange. All those things are in the Bible, which predates capitalism by a hundred, so many hundred years. Um, so when we look at when capitalism comes into existence, it comes out of uh, domestically feudalism, and which which turns into the on the, the international imperial arm of that is uh, mercantilism. And they're similar to capitalism in that they have a, a need for natural resources and need for cheap labor markets. So they push outwards and domestically, from feudalism perspective, the source of power in society is owning land. When you own land, you own the rights to everything that that land produces. What we know as Christians is that this view is not consistent. A feudalist approach is not consistent with our values because you can't own the land. That's God's, that's God's creation. We're just temporary uh, and a, a, a tiny piece of this creation. And we have a, a role in stewardship in our a balancing uh, with creation which is set before us in the Garden of Eden and in the example of Jesus and in uh, various ways throughout scripture. So what changes with capitalism is that the source of power shifts from land to capital. But capital isn't just money because you can have money but you don't have the means to generate more money or the means to meaningfully lobby the government or to uh, to uh, pay for media to support your campaign or support your business. You're, um, you can only do that if you have significant assets or a factory, or in other words, the means of production, which is a constantly evolving what that specifically means. But what it distinguishes, um, as Andrew was mentioning, what distinguishes the classes is some people own that this ability to generate more capital which far exceeds the wealth that is generated in the economy overall, the total benefits to everyone. Um, and not everyone, there's the secondary class, which doesn't own these, uh, this ability to produce wealth and instead has to sell their labor in order to provide for themselves. And herein we have a problem where people are blocked from their abilities to uh, their basic human needs of shelter, water, and food. And it's because of this overall system, which is prioritizing profit over those rights. So uh, you, you kind of framed it as this is an opportunity for the church to give money and to be generous. But another way of thinking about it is that the, uh, having wealth is the, the rights to owning that is obstructing those people like your ability to generate wealth, that right trumps their right to, to basically live. And I, I, I don't think we really have to look far in scripture to see that this isn't 
what Jesus is telling us when he says, do unto the poor, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're not a time. <laughs> I would say, I think it's important to, to think about, like you, I think, Andrew, you said that capitalism at its core is used to generate profit. Um, I guess I would argue that's, that's humans acting as the world does, I guess, as the Bible put it. That's, that's a human projection onto a benign system. That's at its core, capitalism is simply the free movement, the free exchange of goods and labor. And so I think this desire for profit that you guys are talking about, that's, that's, that's our fallen nature. That's our sinful nature being projected onto an otherwise healthy system, I would say. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we do see exploitation and, and significant inequalities that need to be rectified. But I, I, I guess that goes back to just human, human evil or like, you know, just being of this world. I don't think that's inherently a systemic problem with, with capitalism itself, with the institution itself, if that makes sense. And I would argue we can look at um, Acts 2, the church in Acts 2. And I've heard a lot about Acts 2 in the past couple of years, like the church outside the four walls. I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm just reminded of how they were, they they shared everything. The Bible says that they shared everything, that they pulled together their, their food, their their shelter, their resources, and we see that the community the community just flourished. Like that's that's how that's how the church got going. That's how we're here today. And so I would say that's that's actually capitalism because they had the freedom, they had the economic agency to put their goods and their money, their capital where they wanted to. And as a result, we saw the gospel just flourish um, in the early church then. And so I guess that's that's where I get a little. Um, I guess I, I guess I disagree there a little bit. I think capitalism allows. Like Nick said, it just gives us the chance to be able to to provide for others um, because we have the freedom the, to move goods and labor wherever we want to and wherever we need. And so as Christians, it's our responsibility to steward that well and to steward that in a biblical way. And capitalism facilitates that. Uh, so I certainly agree that we have a responsibility under capitalism if we're or under any system, regardless. The, the Bible makes this clear. If we're given wealth, if we're given privilege, talents, it's our responsibility to use it for the least of these, for the church. Um, so there's no doubt about about that. But I I don't know if that necessarily means that, like uh, I think Lydia mentioned, or one of you mentioned, like um, that uh, the, the values of the Bible will, will have predated and will outlast capitalism. Um, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, attribute like these moral values to the system, but regardless, we have to acknowledge uh, what the system entails historically, how it has generated its wealth through exploitative means, how it is currently providing these luxurious conditions and these uh, grocery stores filled with anything we could want. But they're they're things that are produced cheaply. They're things that aren't. It's fast food. It's things that aren't nourishing our bodies. The temple of God. It's things and and the production everything on the line the goal is to cut production to reduce your labor cost to because that profit motive comes at the expense of um we don't look at the value of anything for what it does trees are good for what they can we can turn them into and sell it so it's better to cut it down which, which leads to deforestation it leads to overfishing it leads to dumping chemicals that are n natural byproducts of things that we produce in excess that we don't need, like uh, plastic eggs or something. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I don't know if I can round that out in time. <laughs> Thanks, Brennan. Okay, Noah, thank you for your. Yeah, I think I think we're seeing these are all good points, and it's a complex issue. Um, but I think for me, the biggest point for me is that capitalism. Um, keeps the responsibility to care for the poor on the individual. And that's ultimately what the Bible calls us to. Um, we're called to have a personal, unique relationship with Christ. And we're called to serve our neighbor. You know, um, the great commandment, obviously love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so there's explicit uh, mandates throughout scripture that we have as Christians um, to stand up for the marginalized, to welcome in the poor. And I mean, we know these verses well, like we're, we, we're so familiar with this, we're, we know this. And I guess capitalism, again, I go back to because it's the free movement of, good and, of goods and labor, 
it allows Christians to to be able to steward those well. Um, I think it's helpful sometimes to maybe look at like uh, a different system or like so. In my the the opposite that comes to my mind would be like totalitarian communism, and in that system you have the government um, taking all the capital and then redistributing it among the people. And while you could argue that maybe this um, elevates the elevates the poor and other things that that are consistent with biblical principles, the individual has no say in that. And that's not biblical. There's the individual has no, they're doing it out of rules and regulations um, instead of out of generosity and love. And it's like Paul says in Corinthians, you know, like if I, if I can do all these things, but don't have love, I'm just the clinging of a, of a gong, you know, the clinging of a gong. And, and so it's important that as Christians, we're able to, to, to give these things well, to, to steward our economic um, finances well. Um, and out of love and out of generosity. Capitalism gives us the freedom to do that. In systems, other systems, um, again, communism just comes to mind because that's the complete opposite. The individual has no say in what their capital goes to. It's all the government choosing that. And Christ calls us, like like you and me, we're we're option A here. The government was not not plan A. It's you and me, the church. The church is called um, to, to elevate the status of the poor, to promote reconciliation, educate the next generation, assist the poor, care for the sick. These are all things that it's the church's job to do. Not and it, while it's great to have a government that can do that or a system that that really encourages that, ultimately that's that's our job. Like that that falls on our shoulders as Christians, as individuals. And so we need to have a system that allows for um, for individuals to be able to use that freedom well. And I think you're absolutely right. I think that we do see problems of exploitation. Um, of workers um, and capitalism has a very um, tainted history to say the least um, but I would argue again that's that's human evil um, taking advantage of this system that's not a reflection of the nature of the system itself um, I think of like King Solomon like in the Old Testament you know like the Lord blessed him with crazy wealth like like crazy like richest guy in history right and yet he was able to use it for the good for the good of God you know, he built he built the temple. He he brought in a new wave, a new a new revival um, for religion and for and for God. And so that's an, I think that's an example of someone using stewarding their resources well. And because because again he had this free movement of goods and labor, he was able to glorify God with it. And it's hard to say that he would have been able to do that if there was an institution that I'm sorry, if there was an institution that um, was was not allowing him. Uh, the freedom and the economic agency to do so, um, if that makes sense. And so I guess it just all comes back to me, um, just like Nick was saying, just just the freedom. And as Christians, we, we have the responsibility on an individual level, not the government level, not, not maybe not even like nonprofits, like you and me, like I have a job to go serve my neighbor well. I need a system that can allow me to do that with, with my finances because that's part of the way that, uh, of what God has given me. And so capitalism allows me to do that, to go to my neighbor um, and to serve them well, just as the Bible commands. And so once we can have a system that can do that, that just facilitates um, the, the sharing of resources um, if it's being done um, by Christians who are obedient to God's word. And so, yeah, I guess, I guess capitalism, the system itself, um, I think is biblically sound. Um, but I think the examples that you guys have brought up, I think those are human inadequacies and human shortcomings being put onto the system. It's really interesting when looking at how the Bible Bible treats capitalism, how it's really just acting upon the system that's currently in place. Where slavery is within the Bible, but the Bible never really explicitly calls it out, despite, of course, the Bible being against slavery. Similarly, I would say that the Bible is against capitalism. It's just not going to call out. And instead, it will tell you how to live biblically under capitalism because it can't just call for such large uh, social change for the same reason why it can't call out slavery. Uh, additionally, I find your point on Acts to be really interesting, especially in the sense of when the church first got together and they decided to form their own community, uh, Acts 4.32 states, you know, the whole group of those who believed were one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. 
but everything they owned was held in common. Which, no private ownership and everything being owned in common really does not sound like capitalism. There is no private ownership under Acts 4, which is really weird to have the first people of, uh, that have received the Holy Spirit to come together and say, none, nothing that we have should be separated, but rather all of it should be in common. And you have that from the very first part of uh, Acts, of the early church. Yeah, I, one minute rebuttal, right? Yeah, I would, I would say um, that's because they're living in a society where they have, again, they have the freedom to do that, they have the, the economic agency to do what they want with their money, with, with their capital. So they have, they have the choice um, to share their resources like that. And, and yes, it manifested itself in a lack of private ownership. Um, but I, I, think, I think at its core, it's even like, I know private ownership, I'm sure the professors know, like that's, that's a big uh, component of capitalism. But I think just at its, at its most simplest form, it's the free movement of goods and labor. And, and because of that freedom, that's why we have the example that you pointed out in Acts 2. Great, thank you. Silas, you're up. Right. Um, thank you all for, for your points. I've, I've been very happy to hear everything. I'm very happy that everybody came out here tonight. Uh, I think one thing, and probably one of the primary things I really want to address is, is you guys are really uh, attaching capitalism and freedom and those two ideas together, when that's never been the case. God didn't create capitalism, and then he was like, okay, now you guys have the freedom to choose. Freedom of choice was given to us. Free will was given to us straight from the beginning, straight from the Garden of Eden. There was no system. There was nothing attached to it. Um, I'd also like to say that capitalism, though, like, we have the opportunity to be free under it, uh, well, once again, just freedom is not attached to capitalism. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say capitalism, once again, it abdicates responsibility. Without love, without love being at the core of capitalism, without it being like the mission and the purpose of the economic system, uh, whatever profits we make, whatever moves we make in the economy or with our neighbors or in trade, it's not going to be profitable in a way that really matters in like God's kingdom and the lives of the people around us. I've started, I've started several companies. I've done a lot of work. I'm actually, I'm, I love capitalism, guys. I'm a business major. I love making money. <laughs> but uh, but I also see like a lot of flaws in it in that just making money for its own sake just uh, pursuing those things it's not it's not our main priority whatever business you guys start whatever whatever life path you pursue whatever you do I know it's repeated a thousand times here but you want to make sure you have Christ at the center you want to make sure your values and everything is aligned in Christ and aligned in a way that's loving to yourself and loving to your neighbors. I like I sincerely want the best for each and every one of you. And I think the best is really found in, in us pursuing Christ. And I think a system that solely pursues Christ is going to be a million times better than a system that pursues profit or just sets up economics in a simple way where it's buyer, supply, and that's it. Um, I'd also like to say, like, so there are modern examples of systems where love is pursued first. Finland is a, a very clear example. They're a mixed economy. And so what that means is they're a mix of capitalism, socialism, whatever ism you can think of, they have it in, in a way that works, in a way that really supports people. And um, so the example I'm thinking of is with homelessness. Homelessness in Finland is almost at zero. Zero. Homelessness here in the U.S., there are 3.5 million adults, and with every minute that goes by, there's another person that goes homeless. And, and another shocking statistic, when I was doing research for this, 1.35 million of those people are kids, are kids. And that's, that's like people that our system isn't addressing. And I know it's, it may not solely be capitalism. There may be some political, some religious, all, all these things play into it. But when I look at at Finland, so what they did was, the people who were the most underprivileged, the people who needed the help most, they set up a housing system where they built all these houses, they built all the infrastructure that would be needed to take care of these people. All the homeless people in Finland were able to get housing and receive governmental aid, and 
after like a period of time, as soon as those people were set and ready to, to move forward in life, and not just like as soon as they made enough money to, to afford their own housing, but as soon as they made enough money and had a stable enough job to move out and to be able to sustain their lifestyle and, and flourish, uh, then they would move out. And so what happened was the government poured in a ton of money, a ton of money into this project, a ton of money, killed homelessness in Finland. There, there's almost nobody that's homeless in Finland. And the effects were, uh, I can't remember the social scientists who did the study, but per person, the, the nation, they saved $18,500. They actually profited $18,500 by putting people first, by loving people first. And uh, that was a huge risk for them to take. But at the end of the day, if we take similar risk, and we take those risks in business and life and in every aspect of what we do, uh, we can see tremendous gains. If the U.S. did this with the 3.5 million homeless people we have today, that's a $65 billion profit. I, I, I would love that. <laughs> but I'd also love to see people in houses and taken care of and loved. Yeah, me too. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Finland. And they are absolutely a capitalist system. You mentioned the government a lot. Government is a political system, and not an economic one. They are coupled, political and economic systems are coupled. So what you're mentioning there uh, does not only have an economic system at play, has a large part, that was a political system interfering in an economic system. And we're arguing whether the economic system itself can be biblical. And you mentioned that it isn't attached to freedom, and we need to see, we need a system that seeks God first. There's no economic system that'll seek God first. Uh, that's a theocracy, and we see those don't work. Uh, when you mix the, the politics and the economy together, you get a theocracy, and that's, those, those don't work. Freedom absolutely is tied to capitalism. Why? Because there's nobody telling you what you should do with your money. There's nobody telling you how you should make your money. In fact, you choose how you're going to make your money, and you choose how to spend it. And the best part is that you get to choose to God, and he will glorify your, you, you because you chose to submit to him. And so that's, the, that's what the vital part is. Absolutely, capitalism is freedom because freedom is the agency to do what you would like to do, whether good or evil. God wants us to choose good, and that's what furthers us and his kingdom, is the good. And so absolutely, uh, capitalism is tied to freedom because you're the one making the decision, not, not anybody making it for you. There's no, there's no theocratic leader. There's no political leader. There's nobody telling you what you should do, do with your money. That is entirely uh, up to you, and the choice, hopefully, it would be forgotten. Uh, ready for Christ and his kingdom. <laughs> you guys get a one minute. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm a little curious with the, um, the focus on the freedom aspect because I don't find that as a particularly, um, like even Andrew mentioned, like slavery is in the Bible and the Bible doesn't have this uh, strong sense of like, we need to free all slaves or other more egregious forms of challenges on freedom. So while it, I do obviously think freedom is a good goal, I don't know if that's our priority as Christians to focus on, especially market freedom, because you're not thinking of, you're thinking of freedom in a purely economic sense, your ability to make money or to be generous if you choose to, to choose to do the right thing or to choose to do the wrong thing, which may not be a good idea to have a system like that in the first place if we're all sinful and assuming that, um, uh, that, our sinful nature leads us to being selfish, to not doing the right thing, to not being generous, to holding on, and to using those things to give ourselves our sense of worth, that we earned this, or like, this is mine, instead of recognizing this is God's. God gave this to me. And um, and even things that are beyond our, our ownership, like nature, commodifying our, our relationships with, I mentioned, like trees and um, with, with animals, where they become products, and way, we're looking constantly looking for ways to sell that. And even even how you're looking at uh, charity. Thanks, um, Brandon. That was great. <laughs> Good job. Well done. All right, that is concluding our uh, presentation part. I'm now going to invite the audience. We're going to invite two questions for the affirmative side. We'll give them two minutes to respond to each of those questions. And then two questions for the negative side, and we will give you two minutes to respond to those questions, participants. So are there any questions for the affirmative? Please, come on up, and I'll give you the microphone, and you can 
introduce yourself as a guest to our dinner table discussion. Hi, my name is Jonah. I'm a senior business economics major. This is going to be a long question, so bear with me. I have some scripture to read, which is awesome. I'm going to sit down, if that's all right. Apparently it's not right for the mic. A lot of the questions that we've sort of been talking about is like, can the system be biblical, be coherent with biblical values? Um, I think one of the things we see commonly called from the Bible is caring for the poor. Christ says, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. Um, I have a, one of my favorite passages to read, which I kind of put my cards on the table, but it's one that I think people miss a lot. It's James 5. The title of the passage is Warning to the Rich Oppressors. Kind of strong language, so just bear with me. Um, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded. The corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you have failed to pay to the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the days of the slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent men who are not opposing you. Strong language. So I guess the crux of my question is the heart and soul, like the call, the biblical use of wealth, um, is to not necessarily have excess. The goal is that that excess is given to the poor or given to the church. So I'm going to quote First Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of many evils. So my question is, sorry guys, um, how can you have a capitalist system and still be adhering to biblical values where capitalism is inherently the pursuit of profit, which is excess wealth. And the Bible calls us away from excess wealth in pretty profoundly strong um, and convicting ways. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonah, for that question. Um, that is honestly one of the biggest arguments I guess for against capitalism but you mentioned the Bible verse where it says the love of money is the root of all evils I just wanted to point out that many, it, many, evils. many evils I just want to point out that it says the love of money not money itself mm. and so I'm gonna I learned this in Christian thought so you know we do scripture against scripture so I actually have a scripture verse for you <laughs> first Timothy 6 17 through 19 and it says, this is Paul writing, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And I think if we're looking at the Bible, it's clear that it's the love of of money, which is the root of evil, but not money, not wealth itself. And even if you look in the Bible, like in the Old Testament, how they would glean fields, like Ruth and Naomi, are you guys familiar? They would glean fields, but they would glean it like in a circle, like so the edges are for the poor and for people who like don't have, you know, money, the, the widows to gather the leftover grain. And so because of that, we see that to put scripture against scripture, it's not necessarily money is the problem, but it's more so the love of money. And so I think this kind of goes back to our argument. We're saying capitalism itself is not unbiblical, but we're kind of like Noah and Nick, are, we've all been arguing. It's our role as Christians is to take the individual choices and how are we going to use our money to best glorify God. And so I just want to end on this quote by John Wesley. And he says, earn all you can save all you can and give all you can and i think that's a really practical way to like end this kind of our position for all of us it's a charge yes let's work be excellent do our very best work as hard as we can earn all we can save all we can but give all we can to be generous with the resources that we have to show the love of christ to whoever we come in contact with thank you lydia uh second question for the affirmative team is there a second question Explained it too well. Yes. 
so break those to, costs. Uh, and then that's a piece of paper using my labor, right? And I'm using my energy right now. What would what would the price of this be? Uh, probably nothing, unless it's well, I, I you know use, you I could call it paper, NFT though. and sell it. Maybe. <laughs> also, not a good folding job. <laughs> but I'm just I'm just trying to know like if 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 it's if it's labor. Like I'm using energy right now and so on. If it's labor that produces, I, I think it's more labor. So it's not just doing a thing that took effort because anything is going to take effort with energy or like physical effort. But in terms of producing the commodities in our in our economy, like it takes people to drill the oil and to package it and to farm and to do every aspect of it. There's labor, and then there's a, the sales and the consumers, but they're all separated from each other. Um, rather than um, to go back to the labor theory. So the, the workers are not um, sharing in that wealth. It's controlled by the people that are um, returning on their capital. Thank you, Brendan. Is there a second question? Yes, Martin. Hi, my name is Brad Bauman. I'm a senior IR major. Um, I have a question for yeah, the negative side. How do you reconcile your position with the immense growth and human flourishing that only occurred in the world economy after capitalism and private property came in? Would it be more consistent with biblical principles if we were all equal and poor instead of having a tide that lifted all boats, but it did lift boats in unequal fashion? So uh, first, uh, the first part of that question is, um, so flourishing. I, I think you have to address, I, I didn't have time to talk about this in detail, but where is the, that wealth being generated from? So in addition to this extraction of wealth from labor, when you go back into the evolution of private property, which is what I was talking about with feudalism and mercantilism, there is an enormous amount of wealth that's generated, but it's through exploitative labor practices like slavery, ship, like going over to uh, places where you can extract the resources and or, or exploit that, or exploit them as a labor force. So yeah, that does generate a lot of money. Um, but even if it does produce a flourishing in a, in a like, uh, kind of a, the in-group that, that gets to benefit from this, um, the fact that it creates an in-group and an out-group is part of the problem, that the flourishing isn't targeting collective flourishing, it's a concentrated flourishing. The second part is that while there is a lot of flourishing that occurred, in addition to the problems we have with how it was generated and who ex who got it and who didn't, we also have the problem of, is that sustainable? Can we constantly be generating this kind of wealth? Um, and that, that comes back to what I was um, ending on last time with deforestation. Um, we have other problems, overfishing. Where are we providing the energy for all these things? Where are we getting the, the raw materials? What do we do with the, the excess? Um, and these are solutions that or these are problems that capitalism doesn't have a natural solution for because um, we'll keep doing it as long as we can make money. We'll keep drilling. Um, yeah. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you, audience. I'm going to now invite the judges to step out for a minute. And the participants will each have an opportunity as a team to have closing comments for a minute. So we're going to start with the affirmative. You have a minute. And then the negative. You have a minute. Yeah, so we just wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, kind of to conclude our argument, clearly the Bible upholds creativity. And clearly from what we've argued, capitalism kind of encourages innovation and creativity. Clearly the Bible uplifts the dignity of human freedom and, and because of our arguments, um, capitalism always occurs and gives people the freedom to choose and make their economic decisions. And finally, the Bible commands us to bear one another's burdens and to fulfill the law of Christ. And clearly, capitalism provides an economic system which best allows us to help, to serve, and to be generous with the wealth we're given in order to glorify God for Christ and his kingdom. Thank you, Lydia, and the affirmative side. I want to be talking. I want to be discussing what it means when we say that capitalism is exploitative, 
and it's very core and core profit, and how this goes against uh, the biblical value of equality and loving your neighbors. At its very core, capitalism is competition, where if you have anyone who is going towards greed and is doing whatever they can to make what they're making uh, cost the least that they can and having the biggest surplus in value of profit, then that's going to beat out anyone who's doing it the right way. Where if someone tries to follow the biblical model against someone that's not following the biblical model, the one that's not following it is going to win. That's what it means to be for profit, where the system inherently promotes those that are doing it wrong. And because of that promotion, it's going to be really hard to live under capitalism and do capitalism a biblical way and be consistent with biblical principles. Thank you, Andrew. And the negative side. <laughs> Noah, Lydia, Nick, Silas, Brennan, and Andrew, thank you so much. We're really grateful for your generosity and words and depth of thinking. All right, welcome back, friends. Can we have a drum roll, please, for our winning team? And the Slido results for the winning team is for the affirmative side. Well done. Noah, Nick, and Lydia, thank you. And negative team, you were excellent. So thank you. Another applause for the negative team. Well done. Really some exceptional thinking and care for this dialogue. So I want to express my, my personal gratitude to the six of you. Really appreciated this. And another drum roll for our winning debater, please. And the star selection from the evening on the Slido card goes to one individual, and that individual's name is Ms. Lydia Kang. you all to engage these kind of discussions in your communities by embracing both conviction and vigor simultaneously with the ideas and the values of humility and curiosity. So blessings. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for being with us.